Um, so yeah, just we we've been hosting these Twitter Spaces. Uh, ZK Validator is, is is a validator which is focused on privacy and zero knowledge research. We are validating on a number of networks, including MENA. What we tend to do is run validators on strategically aligned networks, which MENA definitely is. We act as advocates for privacy and ZK. We participate in governance when we can, build tech tools, and launch an and launch initiatives to promote and fund CK Tech. I'm also the co-host of the Zero Knowledge Podcast, which is currently a listener to this event um, and one of the co-founders of the CK Validator. But yeah, today we're going to be talking about ZK, the ZK Apps space. Last time we did a spaces, we looked at the Ignite program, the ZK Ignite program. This time I know we're going to go a little bit broader. I want to pass it to Will Cove, uh, from the MENA Foundation, who's going to be sh kind of leading a lot of this conversation. So, Will, if you want to take it away, please feel free. Hey, thanks very much, Anna, and it's a pleasure again to be here. Um, I'm joined today by Brandon, who's the CTO of Owen Labs. Owen Labs is the uh, team that incubated MENA Protocol and is now building ONJS, the framework written in TypeScript uh, to build zero knowledge applications on top of MENA. And then I'm also joined by Raphael, who is building ProtoKit, which is an application chain framework to build applications on top of Mina using ONJS as well. Um, myself, I am the developer ecosystem lead across the Mina ecosystem. I run ZK Ignite, which is our uh, community owned and funded grants program, a uh, rolling cohort based like innovation fund. And you might also see me uh, at different hackathons and events and uh, rambling all, all around uh, the main ecosystem. Uh, but yeah, so today today we wanted to really talk about not so much what is being built, but how things are getting built on MENA. Um, and as we've seen uh, different approaches, specifically around scalability and privacy, what the trade-offs are, why people would choose to build on, on MENA and, and how you would go about it. Um, so I think maybe I'll start off really quick by just asking Brandon and Raphael uh, to introduce themselves. And then I've got a few questions lined up so we can get right into it. So uh, Brandon, do you mind kicking us off? Yeah. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Brandon. Uh, I am uh, I am the CTO of Open Labs, as, as Will said. Um, I started um, as, you know, uh, I guess as a founding engineer and kind of took on a lot of roles, put on a lot of hats. And now I am, uh, now I'm wearing the CTO hat. Um, so yeah, I, I think Mina's is really cool. I think ZK is really cool. And I'm excited to, to talk to you all about, um, I guess, Mina today. Thanks, Brandon. Uh, Raphael. Yeah. Hey guys. Uh, I'm Raphael. I am, um, the co-founder of ProtoKit. Um, I started like getting into crypto like five years ago. I then spent like three years um, in the Ethereum ecosystem, did some um, smart contract engineering there, and then got interested in CK and found Mina and uh, decided to stay and start building with Mina. And yeah, that was like, I think one and a half years ago. And now, yeah, we found a ProtoKit and are building an L2. Fantastic. Oh, and I see that we have Sebastian who's just joined. Uh, Sebastian is the CTO of D DC Spark, who's building Zeko, a general purpose rollup on Mina. Uh, Sebastian, do you mind giving a quick introduction? I think he's just connecting, so maybe just give him one moment. Oh, we've got you, Sebastian. Hey, yeah. Thanks for having me on board. Sorry, I had another uh, call uh, kind of go over time. Uh, no problem at all. So we're just doing quick introductions. I, I mentioned that you're the CTO of DC Spark yeah. building Zeko. Um, yeah, sure. So I can yeah. expand to that. So hi, Sebastian here, one of the co-founders of DC Spark. So we're a ecosystem builder company. Our goal is to come into ecosystems, build critical infrastructure, and then stick around and help develop those ecosystems by building more and more tools and, and building that community. So we've been in the crypto space for quite a while at this point us and our core founders we started ZC spark um almost three years ago at this point i guess uh, we started working in the mina space uh, almost a year ago at this point uh we were super excited about the tech that mina is building and we looked at a lot of zk solutions we thought mina was uh the best in the market and we thought that there was a need for um basically zk layer twos for mina that are isomorphic that's to say that they're equivalent to Mina in basically every way that matters. And um, that way, if you're a project and you need to use a faster version of Mina, while still maintaining the decentralization security of the Mina network, basically you'll be able to use Zeko to 
have you know faster version of me now with less constraints faster uh, like higher circuit sizes and uh, more account updates and all these kinds of limitations being loosened to you know basically enable you to build um, the zk app you want while still being able to keep the mina layer one um or the most decentralized zk platform out there fantastic thanks sebastian and looking forward to digging into the details of, of zeko in a little bit um but as 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 we start, and I think to bring people up to speed, maybe we can just start with you know, a, a quick overview of of why Mina and, and and really like what the design decisions. Sebastian, you were just mentioning um, security and decentralization. But as as a layer one blockchain, uh, some of the design decisions that went into building the Mina the way it was uh, architected. Um, for me, really, in, when I talk to a lot of the builders around the ecosystem, one word comes to mind, and that is succinctness. So maybe Brandon, I'd like to turn it over to you as someone who has been part of the vision since day one and helped really design the thing in itself. What does succinctness mean when you think about why builders would choose to build on Mina? Um, you know, what were some of the design decisions that, that you considered as and the team considered as you were building it out? And why would that be important to an application developer looking to find their home and, and deciding where to build? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so what does succinctness mean to me? Um, uh, forgive me. I, f I forget like the, the formal definition, but, um, you know, I'll, I'll get, I'll get close. Um, basically, uh, it's, it's this idea that something is, um, very small and, um, and, and not just small, like right now, but small forever. Um, but still, um, so you could say it's, it's O of one for those that know, like big O notation in computer science, that that's why the, the, the company is called O of one labs. Um, so, so it's sort of, it's small, um, and then, uh, and remains small, no matter sort of how much you, you throw out the system. Um, and then at the same time, it's very efficient. So, um, uh, in, in, in this case, like it's sort of quick, uh, in, well, in the context, like we, we can say Mina is a succinct blockchain. Um, that's a, a, a phrase that we use. So in, the, in that sense, like Mina is, is very, the, the, the system sort of remains very small. Um, the the portion that you need to um, the portion that you need to sort of look at to to connect to the network to interact with the network to um, have like complete confidence and trust in the system um, or com complete trust in the system given that you're not trusting uh, your counterparty so this kind of adversarial uh, relationship that we have in, in cryptocurrency um, you you can have that with a, a very small amount of data so we you know. We like to say like 22 kilobytes, um, uh, but in practice, it's it's less than that on mainnet. And in you know in the uh, upcoming um, upgrade that uh, enables smart contracts, um, you know it'll still be small. So yeah, um, so that's sort of that's I guess that that's succinctness. Um, and and you know where where does this succinctness come from? Like ultimately, it's it's from zero knowledge proofs. So I hope in a um, in in a, a Twitter space. Um, hosted by uh, the the zk validator um that you know folks have probably heard of zk proofs at least um but so i i, I won't uh, belabor the point here but um but zk proofs are a nice technology that lets you take um some sort of computation um prove that you ran it correctly and then quickly verify it um so and then the the i guess the real um the real sort of core of mina like why how does Mina actually stay succinct? Because we're, we're not just doing one, uh, w well, if you think about a blockchain, um, like sort of many, many things happen uh, in the system. Like transactions are constantly being added uh, to, the, to the network and being processed and being added to blocks. Um, and sort of the, I guess, the state machine of Mina is, is moved along. Um, and uh, what Mina does is it uses recursive ZK proofs. So it's a ZK proof of a ZK proof of a ZK proof. Um, in order to to power its network and and uh and this allows one single proof to stand in for um an entire blockchain and other systems um and and anyway i i feel like i'm i'm droning on there there's there's more interesting things uh, on how this works how this works with smart contracts and interacts with the proof system uh, of mina um and 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 these things which i which i can get into um but yeah well yeah. It, what shall i keep going do you want to no, no, direct that's, me that's... or that's fantastic. I think, I think, um, one of the things that we've talked about and that consistently comes up with builders across the ecosystem as well is when they interpret succinctness, 
that Mina will remain the same size it is, as it is now 1,000 years from now, no matter what the usage uh, or how many millions of layers there may be on top. Uh, if we do move towards a world where there are layers upon layers upon layers, or you know, um, every application maybe has its has its own rollup, you know, th those are logistics. That the layer one itself will will remain a fixed size due to recursive zero knowledge proofs. And yes. as as other ecosystems and other kind of designs haven't, you know, that were were built before recursive zero knowledge proofs were, I guess, mainstream might not be the right word, but maybe for this audience it is. Um, state state bloat and state growth is is an issue, and it's an issue that with increased usage only um, becomes more and more of a problem. And, and Mina's design in the way that, that you and the team designed it all the way back from 2017 was with this vision that's, that state growth would be a problem, and, and state growth mm -hmm. potentially yields centralization because of hardware requirements over time. And what you get with centralization is you also might get um, censorship risk at, at some point. And so I think uh, when I think about succinctness and some of the way that the, the developers in our community are talking about it, um, and I think going back to Sebastian's point, the decentralization and therefore security that you get, the you know the, the guarantees that there will be no trade-offs is a really, really important point. The, um, yeah, and and just, just, just to double down a bit on that, um, Mina was uh, like very heavily geared towards decentralization and, and security um, to a fault, you could even say. <laughs> but um, uh, but really, like it's something that we did not compromise on. Um, so uh, you can actually think of Mina as like the the first zk rollup. Um, like, I mean, what is a zk rollup? It's like uh, you're you're zk proving a bunch of transactions and then and then like settling them to to some. Uh, to some other chain, so so that 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 part is you know you can argue about and the the, the settling part, but um, but the if you if if you if you take this metaphor like okay Mina is a is like a zk rollup, um, well it's a zk rollup with decentralized sequencers and decentralized provers from day one. Like we um, we believe that uh, you know that's that's not something that that you compromise on at, at the base layer at the base layer now. Um, you know, we're we're here with these uh, we're here with these, these teams building um, these uh, systems that sort of let you tap into that uh, and, and kind of still get the benefits of this super secure decentralized base layer um, and and some other nice properties. Uh, um, so which which I'm sure we'll get into. But um, but but at the base layer, it's really important for it to be super super secure. And um, uh, yeah, and and um, the well, anyway. <laughs> But, I lost my train of thought, but you, you, no, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, ab ab absolutely. And I think that is a good transition to, I, I'd like to kind of now shift to Raphael. Um, Raphael not, I've, I've known Raphael for about a year now when he originally started building um, or just hacking on some of the hackathons we'd had and, and then progressed through the first uh, ZK Ignite cohort. Um, Raphael, maybe my first question to you is if you could talk a little bit about um, your experience building zero knowledge applications, why you were drawn to Mina, and then what you learned building on the base layer versus now having built ProtoKit and, and what ProtoKit is looking to uh, looking to solve. Yeah, definitely. Um, so when I started building with Mina, um, there was like Mina created this really nice library called O1JS, formerly known as Snarkit.js, and what it does is basically it makes the underlying proof system that powers like all of the CK stuff inside of Mina, it makes it accessible for your average developer. So it exposes everything to TypeScript, and then you can start to code your application in a way that is pretty similar to conventional smart contracts. Um, or like, yeah. And I mean, it doesn't do that 100%, but it does, it, it does a very good job of like giving you the, the power to tap into those proof systems and the CK native properties of Mina and start building real applications with that. And that is really nice because the model that it um, basically follows is that you as a client or as a user um, can on your mobile phone, in your browser, um, create proofs that you can then send to Mina and Mina just verifies and, and includes it in, into the blockchain. And that gives you really nice properties like, for example, privacy. You don't ever give Mina any data about you. You just give him the proof at the end of your execution. And Mina can verify that you did that execution correct and yeah, do all of this other stuff in the background. And also additionally with that, Mina doesn't scale with the 
um, computational effort it has to do to execute the smart contracts. Like on Ethereum, you have a fixed um, gas limit per block. That means that you have a certain amount of EVM steps or like computations that your smart contract can do, and you pay for every single um, command that your smart contract um, executes. On Minute, that's different. You can execute arbitrarily many um, uh, uh, arbitrary big computation. You can do as much as you want, and at the end you get a succinct, constant size proof that you can then send um, to the base layer or Mina and yeah, pay a constant fee. Also, That's, that means that Mina scales very well. That that um, so the throughput is potentially unlimited, whereas other um, blockchains that don't use CK have kind of limited throughput. And so yeah, so. Coming back to to like billing on Mina, I started billing it, and of course, as in every system, there are trade-offs, and there are certain things you or Mina is not very well suited to building. So I started to find solutions, and I started building my own like prototypes of like rollups and different uh, solutions to problems that seeker apps face, and that basically led to building ProtoKit. And so what we want to do with ProtoKit is. Um, we provide an abstractions for developers to create and customize um, zero knowledge applications in a way that lets them build a bigger variety of features and yeah and logic in the end. So, for example, in Mina, you you have an issue that is called a race condition. That's like when two users basically want to edit the same state, you have an issue because you only proof them, and that way you can't really. Like basically two users collide and, and we wanted to solve that and we built ProtoKit and we basically moved all the computation that is normally done on the client. We moved it to a sequencer, a centralized entity, but we gave the user the guarantee that all the computation we do in the centralized actor is verifiable and we can't really tamper with the results. And so that way we, for example, eliminated, eliminated race conditions among other features um, or other problems that we solve. and. Yeah, and basically we built ProtoKit, made a custom CKVM, and users can build crazy good applications very easily and have all this infrastructure already built and reusable. Very, very interesting. Um, can you can you can you explain just for for people who are like me in the chat and you hear CKVM and it could mean a million different things? Can you can you unpack in this context what a ZK v, a custom ZKVM on Mina what that means? Yeah, definitely. Uh, so. Like in uh, software engineering, generally, you have this concept of a virtual machine, VM. Um, so that means that normally you have a CPU on your computer that has some set of instructions that it can compute. And that is like your physical machine. And then you, uh, what the virtual machines do, they build on top of these physical machines and provide you an kind of a sandboxed environment where you have different special um, possibilities of, I don't know, computing stuff in the end. And so what a CKVM does, it basically, it, it provides a sandbox environment where you can um, execute your logic that then produces at the end some sort of zero knowledge um, proof. Sure, sure. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's, that's very sense. helpful. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it absolutely does. Um, and and uh, last question before I... Before I move on, but uh, if I'm correct, you've already launched your guys' first product with ProtoKit, uh, and it was a Dex. Is that is that right? Exactly. So we we, we launched Kopang, which is uh, our um, pioneer project, and we launched the sandbox where you can play around, which is already live. Um, it's just a basically MVP kind of demo where you can mm -hmm. play around and start to kind of explore the possibilities of ProtoKit. Um, we also have it all open source, so you can look into the, into the code if you want. And yeah, we in, in the coming weeks and months, we will build that to a full-fledged product and hopefully be the best text that exists on Mina. Fantastic. Fantastic. Cool. Well, I've got more questions, so I'll come to you. But now I, I'd like to, to switch gears a little bit to uh, Sebastian and and um, ask what... So Zeko is an isomorphic layer to... Is isomorphic mean out. What does isomorphic mean in this context? And if you can kind of provide some background around the design decisions to uh, to build an isomorphic layer too. Yeah, so that's a great question. So basically isomorphic means the same equivalent in a sense. Um, so we try and make Zeko as close to the real Mina as possible. 
So it should be that all developer tools work as is, all wallets work as is, all explorers work as is. Um, you can think of this as basically the equivalent of what ZK EVMs are doing for Ethereum, right? EVM is the layer one Ethereum is, is great, but it has a whole bunch of limitations. And ideally a ZK EVM would be exactly, exactly the same as Ethereum, but you know, enable like faster performance and um, all these other benefits. So in the same way, uh, Mina has a layer one and we are building like a ZK Mina, if you will, like in the same way that the ZK EVM project is being built. And so it's basically trying to be as close to Mina as possible. This essentially makes Zeko kind of like a default ground for developers that want to build stuff because by building on Zeko, they get to use the entire, you know, developer experience of Mina, be it all the tools that they have already available, be it even ProtoKit itself or any other kind of DAP so they can build their entire system on Zeko, but take advantage of the faster block times, faster, um, you know, everything um, to just like have a bit better developer experience. So that's the basic idea. And that's why like the fact that Zeko is so similar to Mina is super important because of this reusability of the whole tech stack. And so that's how we, we've made like the, the goal of, of, of Zeko and in practice, what that means is that a lot of the Zeko code base is also um, working on Mina itself. Um, a lot of the code that we're writing for Zeko is, you know, circuits written in OCaml into the main Mina code base. So as we develop Zeko, uh, it also means we're super aligned with the development of Mina itself and we're actively contributing the code and improvements to the main uh, Mina code base as well. So it's great um, for developers, it's great for Mina itself, and it really aligns everybody together to create an awesome developer experience. Fantastic. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I know that there's a lot of developers who have been trying to build on the layer one who are, who are eagerly awaiting um, Seco's release specifically for, for that, um, I guess, isomorphic, isomorphic properties. Uh, now I have that word in my dictionary. Um, but uh, Sebastian, as someone coming from multiple, I, I know that um, DC Spark has done work across a number of different ecosystems. What drew you, you know, if if Zeko is kind of an improvement on the performance and scalability of Mina itself, I'd like kind of your perspective on what drew you into the Mina ecosystem from a application or from, from a use case or what types of applications might be possible and what you get excited about that can be can be built on Zeko and on, in the MENA world? Yeah, so that's a great question. So um, DC Spark, one of the first projects we worked on is something called Milk Vita, which was basically, uh, what if you take the concept of layer twos and instead of using it for scalability, use it for interoperability. So uh, we started by basically adding EVM support to both Cardano and Outbrand as like an additional layer on top of the base chain. and not only like this, does this allow, allow like new dApps to be deployed to these chains that would not otherwise uh, be able to be deployed. We spend a huge amount of time focusing on the user and developer experience uh, for that system. So for example, for the Cardano deployments, um, you can now deploy EVM dApps to Cardano through Milkmeta and you don't need to go download an EVM wallet. Uh, you can keep using your Cardano wallet and use these dApps directly. You can keep earning your staking rewards, even if you're an EVM DAP or an EVM user. So like from all the perspective of, from a developer, from a user, from all the Cardano functionality, you don't even have to know you're using the EVM layer. It just feels super native. And so we have, you know, quite a lot of experience, you know, kind of obsessing over this like developer experience and user experience and making that as smooth as possible. And when we were looking at ZK, which we thought was kind of like the next frontier uh, for technology, we really liked Mina because not only does it have the best tech in the market, Mina is uh, was pointed out earlier, um, can be kind of seen as like the CK rollup for all chains. Like you can so easily bridge, um, or like post state proofs of Mina to other platforms. And so naturally, uh, Mina can be like the competition layer of so many other blockchains that don't have their own kind of native CK layer. And so we were super interested in leveraging, you know, Mina for this kind of use case. And so as an extension of, of Milk Mina and, and under the Milk Mina umbrella, we started working on Zeko, what eventually became Zeko, to basically, you know, turn Mina into this this kind of platform. And so to kind of get there, we noticed that there's some improvements need to be made on the developer experience. And so we've been working on this isomorphic, you know, uh, layer two for Mina called Zeko. And then the goal is that once we have this in place, then we have a great developer experience, great user experience, and then we can start, you know, connecting Zeko and, and Mina to different uh, chains and different projects. So as a concrete example of this, 
Um, we have another project we're working on called Pima Studios, which is a framework for creating on-chain games in autonomous worlds. We're the second largest framework for creating on-chain games in the world. Um, and so uh, through this, we'll be essentially adding um, Zeko and Mina as like the ZK layer for these games. And so even if you deploy a game on Ethereum or some of these other chains, you'll essentially be able to leverage uh, Mina and Zeko to build up the ZK layer for your chain. So that kind of shows how in the grand vision, like we're working on Mina to basically leverage the Mina technology to connect this to all these other chains and empower all these amazing use cases. Mm, that is super interesting. And I think not something that we talk a lot about um, because at least from my perspective, working the developer ecosystem, a lot of the conversation immediately goes to use cases, which then leads to privacy. And that's kind of where outside of scaling blockchains themselves, uh, that's where ZK kind of just gets pigeonholed right into the privacy, but thinking about ZK and state, uh, proofs as an interoperability, interoperability play across different blockchains is really fascinating. Um, that kind of makes me want to ask Brandon, I know you've been doing some work with the Lambda class team on the, uh, verification bridge between Ethereum and Mina. Can you like, can you talk about how that might play into this vision as well? And, and how you think about that? Yeah. 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 So, um, I would say I'm, I'm, uh, I'm frequently, you know, talking to them and meeting with them. Um, but they're certainly doing, doing all the work. I'm, I'm just sort of. You know, uh, I'm just here cheering them on and, and you know, uh, answering some questions. But but yeah, so so Lambda class is um, is working on a um, uh, an an uh, EVM um, bridge for the for the Mina state proof. So so the way and and the, the way this works, there's 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 like a couple ways you you could build something like this. And and this particular design is is really interesting. Um, the way it works is. Uh, um, Sorry, I'm just realizing like maybe I shouldn't go so deep into the weeds here. But but um, at a at a high level, um, so so the the proof system that that powers uh, Mina um, and and ZK apps and and all and all of these systems around it is uh, it's Kimchi, and it's also something that you know we uh, work on a lot um, at O One Labs. I guess we've we've created it as well, so that's that's why we work on it. But um, and and kimchi's back end well ki kimchi's whole like reason for existence is um it's a proof system that has really efficient recursion um and then with that core it's like what else can we do and and like what what other features can we add to unlock different things so that's the, that's that's like kimchi um so um so so to like to maximize sort of like the the properties for mina Kimchi's backend is configured with the pasta curves. They're called the pasta curves. Interesting. Um, and uh, and an inner product argument for sort of uh, think of that as like the secret sauce for making the zk work. Um, now in uh, on the EVM, um, you can verify uh, zk proofs relatively um, efficiently if they're written against the the BN uh, two five four curves. This is just a bunch of jargon, but um, and and uh, and and then and then there's also sort of um, you know reasons why you want to use a different um, a different sort of core of the zk uh, so like kzg um, is is the particular one that we're using so so what what this um, what this bridge does is it it is um, sort of taking kimchi uh, the instantiating it with a kzg bn two five four backend which is something that uh, we we just had sitting around in our in our code base um, and then writing a a circuit uh or writing a a, a program essentially in o1js that verifies the the pasta ipa mina proof from inside of the kzg bn um backend uh and then uh and then and then when you have a proof that's this proof that's kind of wrapped up uh you can verify that um pretty easily in solidity uh and and, and not use too much gas so that's 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 kind of the, the rough idea um but yeah, what what that will unlock is the ability for, um, yeah, Mina, uh, the Mina blockchain, or or any or any of any L twos built on top of it uh, to um, be sort of efficiently ferried over to any EVM chain, um, or and and you know from that starting point, it's also easy to to build um, other sort of backends to other chains as well. Mm. Yeah, very yes, very interesting. So if I'm uh, taking the kind of kindergarten approach to understanding this, if most, if most of the 
the execution environments are being separated from base layer environments in most ecosystems and moving into a roll-up centric future. There's different types of roll-ups that those applications could be deployed on, but it's looking increasingly like these are going to be mostly ZK at their core, ZK roll-ups at their core. And the ZK roll-ups all need to, like, dependent on the ecosystem, are going to need, need to settle somewhere, but across many ecosystems, there isn't a native ZK layer. And because Mina has uh, ZK, it is a, it is a proof it is a recursive proof in itself. It is a roll-up in itself. Um, Mina is potentially positioned quite well to to settle these proofs from from various different uh, proof systems, uh, depending on, I guess, how things uh, evolve. But but am I understanding that vision correctly? Starting yeah. with Ethereum. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yep. That's exactly right. And and it's not it's not just it's not just the fact that it sort of has zk at its core. Um, it's it's this recursive zk at at the core. So the mm. the the, this this recursion is so powerful. Like and and we we well, I, I hope everyone sort of knows what recursion means. I mean, you, you can kind of think of it like um, you know a picture and a picture and a picture and a picture, or like um, uh, some kind of like self referential loop. Um, anyway, whatever. <laughs> Hopefully that's enough. Um, but yeah, so so it's it's the fact that you can like look at the proof system from within itself, and 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 we we see this pop up even in this conversation. Like okay. Mina itself is a is a recursive proofs. Um, the applications on Mina are themselves proofs that we recursively fold into Mina. Those applications can be recursive proofs. You can build um you can build a a a framework uh, a zkVM framework using recursive proofs that then have recursive proofs inside of them uh, and that's protokit and those can recursively fold up into Mina. You can have even a copy, like I mean, it's it's slightly different, and there's all these like interesting properties and things that uh, is what you know uh, Sebastian was talking about. But like, you can have like Mina itself recursively fold into itself, uh, and you get all and you get this nice system. And then and then you can stack everything together. You can have Mina. You can have Mina like folding into EVM. You can have Zeko on top of Mina, Protokit on top of Zeko, and your application on top of Protokit, and your application can do a bunch of recursive proofs. Um, so anyway, mm, interesting. So let me let me let me channel that back to Raphael for a second. As someone who's kind of like in the application developer mindset, has previously chosen his home of where he wants to build, and why why what what is that? Why is that important to you, Raphael? Like if you're if you're kind of putting now that you've built, you have built the framework, so of course you're biased a little bit. But maybe take that hat off for a second and and think about you know you're you are going to build a dex and you're you're thinking about where you want to build it. What, why does why does recursion matter or I kind of break break down what um what that means to you yeah so um I think like I think Brendan already touched on it a little bit but so our idea also with like app chains and general purpose rollups is that you can kind of build this um tree on top of a layer one that kind of incrementally um, adapts to the applications or the user's needs. So like you can have different um, roll-ups that have like take away different guarantees, but give you a new one, um, give you some certain UX elements that you can only um, like th that are kind of custom. And I think with that in mind, you, you have a really versatile um, possibilities of what you can build on top of what like, so, and I mean, also like with with, with product kit, um, what we want to do is get, give give the developer the most possibilities um, that that any framework can have. So any part can be replaced. Like you can have a different mempool um, implementation. You can have a private. You can have decentralized. You can use the layer one as a mempool, for example, and you can have different interoperability modes that all all give kind of different features and take away different guarantees and kind of this balance between them um, fits really nice into CK because um, this recursive steps actually enable that and, and, and enable you to um, kind of transfer different properties from a base layer to the next one. Mm, mm, mm. Interesting. Sebastian, do you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I think that was a um, good explanation. I think at, at the end of the day, these solutions, these approaches are you know, uh, fairly composable and and tackling kind of different sides of the app, uh, of like the problem space. Uh, so I think for a lot of these projects, like we'll basically be able to leverage, you know, both some of the work that, you know, ProtoKit is doing and some of the work that we're doing at Zeko. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. 
Um, sorry, I didn't mean to add on to the why protokinetics as much as um, why recursion at its core, the way that Brandon described it, is so important to yeah. kind of serve as the so, long-term computation layer. Yeah, so maybe I can give um, two kind of concrete examples. One of them is like the kind of easier to understand one, which is a DEX. For a private DEX, you want to have some kind of um, private layer beyond what Mina give by default. So in Mina, you have private smart contracts, but not private balances. But for a private DEX, you want private balances as well. So by building a, a layer two, basically you can create a custom DEX that has private balances as well um, to facilitate this kind of private DEX. So I think this is kind of like a you know more financial use case. That's like a very common one. The other one that we're super interested in for gaming is basically having um, ZK state channels. The idea is that if you have, for example, a game that's like a 3v3, um, you might have a lot of transactions on chain. Like every time any player in the game makes a move, this is a transaction on chain, uh, which might be kind of heavy, especially like transaction fees and block times, all of this kind of stuff. What you can do instead is you can create kind of a state channel between all the different players of that game. So you're basically spinning up a layer two for that specific game. Uh, you play the rounds, everybody submits their moves, and then after the match is over, you have a winner, and then you can recur. You can compress this entire uh, match history into a single proof that proves who won the match. And so through this system, you have essentially, you know, reduced the amount of transactions you have to actually submit on chain by a significant, uh, you know, amount. And so it allows you to have you know, much more scalable, you know, online games and these kinds of use cases. So this is some of the stuff that we're interested in Pima and kind of like a use case that can only be done because of recursive proofs. Uh, very interesting. Yeah, I'm very excited to see the evolution of the gaming world using these proofs and Pima's leading the way. Um, cool. Um, so I, 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 I know we're kind of getting to the, to the top of our time here. Um, I think I, I, first, I just want to turn it over to Sebastian and Raphael once more to ask just how we can find out more about your projects. And then I'll wrap us up with, with a few updates on what's going on in the MENA world. So maybe Sebastian, how, how can we learn more about Zucco and, and how can people get involved? Yeah, so you can learn more by following DC Spark as well as the Zucco Labs account. I think Zucco Labs is on the Twitter space that the DC Spark account is. Um, so you can follow us there. We'll definitely post all our updates um, as well as some of these might uh, be seen on the Milk Media account if you're interested in like Milk Media kind of and some of the other work there. But I'd say by following uh, DC Spark and Zeko, you'll get kind of all these core Zeko related updates as well as if you're interested in some of the gaming stuff we're working on, um, there is the PyMet Studios account you can follow as well. PyMet Studios and Zeko are two separate things, um, but they are kind of like sister projects in a sense. Fantastic. And and Raphael, where can we learn more about uh, ProtoKit and get in touch with you? Yeah, so um, we also have a Twitter for ProtoKit and we have a separate Twitter for Kapang or Dex. Um, but um, generally, like we have the website protokit.dev where you can find all the links to our socials. Um, also a link to our Discord where you can join and ask questions or just look around. And also on the website, we have um, yeah some just general um, introduction to product kit and our starter kit with, with which you can um, start building right away and explore product kit and yeah otherwise tweet and discard fantastic um, and on on behalf of on the Mina foundation side of things I just want to give everyone the heads up that if you're interested in building on either of these l2s or building out other infrastructure across the Mina ecosystem right now. We, we've just launched a program called Mina Navigators, where we have uh, 6 million Mina tokens available in grants over the next six months. We're in the middle of a hackathon right now, which uh, is the first chance that you can get to earn a Navigator badge. If you earn a badge, then you can build uh, consistently and earn, and earn monthly incentives by um, completing challenges and, and also just showing contributions to your project. I also mentioned Seek Ignite at the very beginning, which is our rolling community governed innovation fund. So we're going to be, we're in the middle of cohort two right now. We have 25 projects that are building and you kind of think about it as like a, a pre-accelerator program. So we're really excited to see what the results of that are. Um, we also have ETH Global coming up. We'll be uh, at Istanbul for DevConnect. We also have O1 Labs is sponsoring Zeek Hack. And then we also have Test Worlds 2.0 incentivized testnet, which is an adversarial testnet that's running to prepare for the launch of ZK apps on mainnet. Um, so lots to get involved. Uh, I would say the easiest place is just to follow Mina Protocol on, on Twitter and, and you'll be able to see all the updates there. Uh, before I turn it back to Anna, 
Brennan, anything else to, to add before we, before we close out? Yeah. Um, you know, for any developers, uh, who I guess, you know, well, as well said, like we we're excited for you to work on, uh, you know, build ZK apps, work on ONJS. Um, but you know, you can also contribute, uh, we're open source projects, uh, to, and we love contributions and ask us questions and we'll, we'll answer them. Amazing. Uh, and I, one more note, uh, Protokit also has a workshop tomorrow. Maybe someone can drop the link in the chat, uh, around how you can get involved if you want to learn more about it. Um, but Anna, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much for having us again. It's for sure. It's been a pleasure. We're, we're massive fans of the podcast and yeah, it's just an honor to be here. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you so much for kind of sharing all of this with us. If there are folks that have questions, why don't you add those under the tweet with the spaces? That would be just one way for us to gather them. Um, and I do want to just say, like, listening to this, I feel like there's a larger trend happening in ZK right now, which is this move from the pure research front to much more product focused, um, yeah, sort of sentiment. And there are these, you know, I, I feel like what's what ZK apps kind of offers is this new environment where people can start to properly experiment on all of those use cases that we've been talking about for years, where it used to be you needed to be like a applied cryptographer to even be able to kind of build those things. Now, you know, developers with different skill sets can actually start to jump in and, and play with it. And I do want to just highlight once again, ZK Hack, which is happening in just over two weeks in Istanbul. So this is our IRL hackathon, as Will mentioned. Oven Labs is a sponsor and a partner, so they're they're going to be doing a workshop. There will be a focus on these kinds of uh, frameworks and languages at this event. It's it's like a fully zk focused hackathon. If you're not familiar with it, check out zkhack.dev uh, or look up zkistanbul.com. Those are the two links, and you can also find it through. We'll we'll post it potentially after uh, this spaces as well. But yeah, I want to say thank you so much, Will, for basically running this and and bringing all these great guests. Thank you to everyone who is listening. Um, yeah, and looking forward to our next one. I know that we're planning this as a series. I think it's just really nice to be able to check in with the community. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, thank you again for having us. It's been a pleasure. Cool, cool. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.